Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite cures for being in a creative slump, like I am right at this moment. <laughs> it's wide angle macro photography from A to Z, or Z, or both. Wide angle macro photography is one of those disciplines in photography that takes a little while to learn, takes a lot of practice to be any good at, but is immensely gratifying and great fun to do. Today we're going to talk about the whole shebang from start to finish. I'll talk about the equipment that you need, how to use it, how to find your shots, how to compose them, and how to deal with the very predictable problems that you're going to run into. We've got a lot to cover. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and the folks who've made donations through my channel. You guys are awesome and I couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. Probably the easiest way for me to sum up what wide angle macro is, is to compare two photographs. This is a macro photograph of a spider. And this is a wide angle macro photograph of a particular spider that's over your head and could drop down the back of your shirt at any moment. And we know that because we've added perspective. We're looking up at the sky, not normally something you do with a spider unless it's over your head. And that kind of sums up what is so wonderful about wide angle macro. You get to spin a tale, tell a story about your photograph. It's more than just a beautiful, intricate, carefully lit macro photograph. It's that too. But it's also a photograph with context. It's hard to pin down exactly what a wide angle macro photograph is. And I am very open minded about that. There are some folks out there who have some rules about what constitutes a wide angle macro photograph, like it's got to consist of a field of view of at least 90 degrees or 100 degrees or whatever the rule is. And that uh, in addition to that, the subject has to be at least at one to one magnification or greater. And there are probably other rules as well. But like I say, they don't mean much to me. What is important to me is that the photograph is effective. There are probably some people out there that will look at one of your wide angle photographs and say, it's not wide enough. Sorry, I can't like it. It's not wide enough. Well, I'll like it if it's a good photograph and I won't measure it. So let's talk about the gear. Wide angle macro is technically challenging, but the important part is not so much the equipment as understanding the principles and practicing new skills. But the equipment is nonetheless important. We have, to, we have to have a specific kind of lens to do this kind of photography, but I'll wager that every single one of you will have one of the solutions I'm gonna show you now. Now, there are two commercially available wide angle macro lenses that I'm familiar with and that I've tried. The first lens is from Leowa, and that's a 15 millimeter F4. Uh, macro wide angle lens and uh, it's a pretty nice looking lens and it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It has a feature that is worth its weight in gold and that is it has a tilt mechanism. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute. The other one is from Mitocon Zonji and uh, I think this is also a Chinese lens but it's very unusual. It has a focal length of 20 millimeters which is great uh, and it has a, a fairly wide aperture of f2, but the thing only takes pictures at four times magnification, which is in itself very challenging to do. Uh, you're working at very short working distances, and the odd shape of the lens makes, uh, makes lighting a little less difficult than you would think, but it's still a tricky lens to use. Let's assume for right now that nobody actually has one of those two lenses. And I'm gonna be talking now to everybody who just has a camera. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, sensor you have though, it will impact the lens that you wanna use. It doesn't matter whether your camera is a mirrorless system or you have an 
entry-level DSLR or a big flagship DSLR. doesn't really matter. There will be a lens that will work for you. The idea is we need a wide angle lens as a foundation, but we need to modify it in such a way that we can work at a very short focal distance, i.e. we can take magnified images. The secret to the equipment is you just use a wide angle lens, but you add some extension to it, just like you would do if you were trying out macro photography with a 50 millimeter lens only. We're not shooting with a 50 millimeter lens. We're shooting with lenses with uh, focal lengths of 11 millimeters in one case, 16 millimeters in another. And when you're shooting at those kinds of focal length, a very little amount of extension goes a very long way. And that's what makes this so technically difficult is we're gonna have to walk a very, very fine line between having enough magnification while also maintaining a large enough field of view because the two are operating in different directions and whatever we do to one is going to impact the other but i'll explain that in just a second first let's look at the actual lens solutions that i've come up with and I just pulled stuff out of the, the cupboards and started building systems. And I've tested each and every one of them. And as we go, I'll give you the highlights on what I found. So if you want to buy a dedicated wide angle macro, you can get the uh, Leowa lens for right at 500 bucks and you can spend only $150 to get the Mitocon. I think the one for Canon is a little more expensive, but the Nikon one's only 150 bucks but you don't need it. You will get exactly the same performance, maybe not to the layer because of the tilt uh, mechanism, but exactly the same performance using any wide angle lens with the right amount of extension. I'm gonna start out by talking about the setup that I use, my go-to setup, and then I'll show you all the alternatives that, that are out there. My favorite setup is to use my full-frame camera, the D850 that's pointing at me right now. And onto that, I put 12 millimeters of extension tube. If I could, I would put 10 on here, but I don't have a 10 millimeter extension tube. And I highly recommend you get one of the ones that has contacts so that you can control the lens because you're going to need to. That is it. That is the whole setup. And one thing that you need to know right up front is you can get rid of the lens hood because you'll never use it. Um, it's virtually impossible to use it. This particular setup on a full frame camera with the focal length set at, I usually work right around 21. 21 millimeters on a full frame camera will give this a field of view of 100 degrees, which is really very wide. It will also allow me to focus as far away as 20 millimeters. And it is a razor thin band of focus. So I can get 20 millimeters in front of this lens to get, it's actually 0.7 to one magnification. So it's a little less than one to one, but it's still pretty good. If I want to get more magnification out of this, all I have to do is uh, reduce the focal length to 18. When I do, my working distance drops to one millimeter, literally. It means that my specimen has to be all but touching the front element of the lens, which is why I can't even use filters on these lenses. Normally, I use filters uh, to protect the lens, uh, but you can't do that with this because if you're going for the most magnification you can get, there isn't any room for it. So this is a fantastic lens for this. It's light but it's really, really nice quality. Uh, it's the uh, AFS uh, Nikkor 18 to 35. It's only uh, f3.5 to 4.5. It's a G lens. 
but it has seven blades uh, in the diaphragm. So the, the outer focus parts, which are half of the photograph in this, in this style of photography, is really creamy and smooth and, and pleasing to look at. This isn't a cheap lens. Uh, you could actually buy the Leowa, two of the Leowas for this. But if you have a nice full frame, uh, short focal length, wide angle zoom, that'll work fine. There is only a limited range in which you wanna use these lenses. Using it at 18 is impractical. Uh, using it at 24, it starts to look more like a macro lens. And using it all the way up at 28 or 35, it, it is just a macro lens then. Your entire wide angle closes in on you and you end up with the isolated subject out front and all interest in the background, it gets compressed. So while this lens is not cheap, um, and there, I'm going to show you some lenses that are a fraction of this price. It, uh, it, the only thing you have to add is a little bit of uh, extension, 12 millimeters or 10 if you can. If I could do this with 10 millimeters, it would allow me to get down to 19 maybe or 20 millimeters focal length and have a little bit more room to get my subject in. So let me show you some of the other alternatives that uh, are equally good, equally useful. One is for a crop frame camera. This is my D7500. Uh, this works really, really well with an inexpensive Tokina lens. This is the SD 11 to 16 millimeter f2.8. It's made for the DX camera. Don't be too misled by the 11 millimeter uh, focal length. That is actually uh, obviously 16 millimeters. It's the same as this lens on a full frame camera because this is a DX lens made for this uh, smaller frame. This is a heavier lens. It's built like a tank. Uh, I love it. I, I know a lot of people aren't excited about third party lenses, but this, this Tokina I've had for many, many years and it is brilliant for this kind of stuff and for uh, landscape stuff. I, I just love it. Again, you can lose the lens hood. You're never going to be using it. You're never going to have enough room. Even though the, the lens is a little bit smaller and the camera sensor is a little bit smaller, your distances turn out to be pretty much exactly the same. Meaning that by the time you're at one-to-one -one with this, you're on the lens. And in order to use it comfortably and effectively, you probably want to be up around 21 millimeters. But when you do, it's very, very usable. Uh, the third option is even more affordable. This is an entry level DSLR. This is a, a, a D3400. Uh, it's the cheapest camera that Nikon makes. And it has on it the lens that comes with it. Don't be misled, this kit lens, the, the um, AFP 18 to 55, is actually a remarkable lens. Um, I, I found it to be so useful in other areas of macro too. But this just sits on the shelf, and I thought, I wonder if this would also be able to, to handle wide angle macro. And just by adding one segment of extension, just exactly the same as I did with the other two, it does, and it takes beautiful pictures. Your distances are about the same. And uh, yeah, the only problem is this camera is completely automatic. It doesn't have buttons for anything. So I don't even know how to change the uh, aperture on this thing, because there's not a button for it. So anyway, it, this wouldn't be my first choice, but if this was the only camera I had and I wanted to try this wide angle macro, Absolutely, you can use this all day long. There are a couple of advantages to this lens that you don't get with the uh, fancier ones. Uh, the main one being when this thing is actually at 18 millimeters, the lens is way out from the, from the camera. And this just has less stuff at the end of the lens to get in the way to prevent you from getting right on top of your subject. 
this lets a whole lot more light in too from the side. So yeah, this is definitely one option. When I get more comfortable using a mirrorless camera, I'll probably end up using this one all the time. The Fuji X-T2. And onto it, I put a keep on tilt shift adapter, which is awesome. On top of that, I use the same 12 millimeter piece of extension, like so. And uh, there's one trick I need to show you. This Nikon lens does not have a manual aperture ring and you absolutely have to be able to control the aperture. So what I have done is I have cut out a little piece of plastic. It's just a piece of soft foam. If you take this little piece of foam and you stick it to hold the actuator for the aperture, it'll hold firmly, it won't fall out, and uh, it'll hold the aperture open to the extent that you've cut the, the cube. I have several of them in different sizes. So if I know I'm gonna be trying to shoot at say f14, which is not unusual doing this kind of photography, I have an f14 sized piece of rubber that I put in there. And then this simply goes right back on the, the adapter the way it was. And now when I put my Nikon lens on there, the aperture will be held open uh, at uh, whatever I have it set at now. Now I won't be able to change it, but I can work around that most of the time. Using the tilt and shift capabilities of this lens with the adapter, I'm able to change the plane of my focus in such a way that it aligns better with my subject so that I can get more of my subject in sharp focus. This thing lets me do stuff that, that even the full frame camera doesn't. These uh, keep on adapters come for every mirrorless camera and they go to every DSLR lens. So you can get them in, in any combination. They're not cheap but they're not expensive considering what a PCE lens from Nikon costs. They don't show up in the uh, used market very often, uh, which is a shame, but if they do, snap one up. Let's talk for just a minute about finding your shot, because this is very different. Normally, when I'm going out to do macro, I go to wherever the specimens I'm interested in live, and I dig around till I find them and I photograph them where I find them. It's very different when you're actually going out to do wide angle macro. Now, sometimes what I will do, in fact, most of the time, what I do is I go to an area that I want to photograph in and I spend the first few minutes walking around, looking at the various different perspectives from the ground looking up from on top of something, looking down, looking in every direction. And remember, your background is going to be out of focus, tastefully out of focus. So instead of looking for detail, look for colors and light and dark and lines and uh, outlines of buildings artificial lights. All of these things are going to have a life of their own in a wide angle macro shot. So try to think more of the background as a texture or a canvas that you're going to be taking your photograph over. I have absolutely no problem with taking something out to photograph it. If you've got a nice pickled spider that, that you think would look good in a photograph like this, then by all means, take it and plonk it down on something and make it look alive. The idea is to keep your eyes open for things that will work and do not get hung up on size. If you're constantly trying to push to one-to-one, -to -one, if you're trying to work at the very, very shortest distance and get the very largest magnification out of your system, you're not gonna see opportunities to shoot larger things. That's how I go about it. And it's a very organic, feely kind of process. You walk around, you look, you soak everything in until you see ideas popping up. So when you get to that point and you have something you want to photograph, we need to set up our kit. 
If you're just starting this and you've never done it before, I highly recommend you take with you and use a tripod, something that will fold out pretty much to the ground because you're going to be using that perspective, that ground perspective a lot. It works in this kind of photograph. You're also going to need a remote trigger or uh, you can just use, use the delay, the shutter delay on your camera if you prefer. Another must have is one of these. It doesn't have a name. It's just a metal stick with a clamp on the end. I'll call it a clamp stick. Your subjects are very, very seldom still. And oftentimes you're shooting a bug on a plant or you're just shooting a flower. And if there's the slightest bit of breeze, it limits greatly what you're going to be able to do with the shot. But something like this that you can stick in the ground and clamp to a stem right below your field of view will hold it rock solid. So I never go out to do this kind of photography without one of these. And I've also got a longer one with a sharp point on it that I thought I better not show. It looks like a weapon. If you're fortunate enough to have a three-way geared head for your tripod, take that with you. The thing is, with this kind of photography, the slightest change in perspective can make a dramatic change in the photograph. And being able to, from your tripod, simply move the camera in one dimension or another and, and have it stay there, <laughs> That's the important part. Having a steady platform to work from, something that you can adjust in real time, will make it easier for you. The most difficult challenge to deal with in wide angle macro is lighting. So there are a few ways that you can deal with the light. The most basic way is to expose for the background, the, the out of focus background, and then add as much light as you need in order to properly expose your foreground. That makes sense. That's the way you would do it with any other kind of photography. Unfortunately, that technique doesn't work very well in wide angle macro. It's because of how close the, the, the subject is to your lens. Adding light sounds like it would be fairly easy to do. I carry my loom cube with me and a little pen light. But when you put the loom cube right here to illuminate the, the insect, you're also illuminating the front element of the lens. And the amount of flare you're going to see is it's uh, disheartening and very off-putting. You can get it right if you're using a little less magnification or a slightly shorter extension tube, if you're shooting maybe at, at uh, 25 or 26 millimeters, you might have enough room to use a light. That's why I carry it. Positioning a speed light on a clamp so that the, the bulb is facing down in front of the lens can give you good results. But if you're off by a fraction of a millimeter and that flash hits your lens, you've got nothing but a white mess. So you're probably thinking, well, why don't you use a ring light or a ring flash? Yes, I do use both of those. There's, there's problems with both. The, the first is ring flashes are not made for wide angle lenses. They're made for the kind of lenses you would want a close up flash to use, like macro lenses. In order to fit one of these ring, ring flashes, onto a lens, you need to add adapters because they don't screw on directly. They have a, a, an adapter that clips in. But in order to fit the adapter onto the lens, you have to add a few more millimeters of extension to the lens. And in doing so, you bury your subject even further inside the lens. And add to that the fact that you've got another five millimeters of extension from the light itself, you'll soon see how none of the light actually gets down to where the subject is. If you really need to use a ring light, you can do that by increasing slightly the focal length of your lens. That will give you a little less magnification. It'll move the specimen a little bit further forward from the lens and use your focus ring 
to push the focus out towards infinity. That will buy you a little extra space, just a few millimeters sometimes, but enough for you to get the light from these uh, systems onto your uh, specimen. A quick word about focus stacking. If you want, and if you are in a really stable environment where your tripod's solid and you don't have a lot of wind and your specimen isn't moving, you can certainly focus stack your subject, but you can't focus stack anything else because with the extension tube, you're not gonna be able to focus to infinity. So you're gonna be very limited in how much focus you can gather, even focus stacking. I would rather use a tilt adapter to do the same thing or close to the same thing, but in some circumstances, that might be the only way to go. One other thing about focus stacking, don't bother taking your rail. Uh, you cannot focus stack on a rail using a wide angle lens. Instead, use the focus ring on the camera. Another way you can do it, of course, is to get one of those Helicon focus gadgets that advances the focus for you, much the same way that uh, the higher end Nikon DSLRs have that focus shift capability. It's the same kind of idea so that you can do your focus stacking without moving the camera and lens. Every now and again, the only way that you can get sufficient light onto your subject is to bracket your exposures and you have to bracket really widely. You have to bracket so that your background is perfectly exposed as well as your foreground and your foreground's getting very little light. Taking good wide angle macro photographs is a matter of making compromises, but the range with, within which you can wiggle is very, very narrow. So simply moving your focal length uh, by a millimeter may give you all of the, the uh, break you need to get light to your subject. There are things that you can do, subtle changes you can make with your feet and your body position to be able to get that precious little bit of light onto your subject. So if you're outdoors uh, shooting, say, in the evening, the light's coming from behind you. You need it to come from behind you so you can get the, the beautiful light on your background, but your shadow is blocking the light getting to the specimen. So sometimes you need to move a few degrees to the side, rotate your camera, move the subject to the right hand side of the frame, hold a card above the, the lens just to bounce a little bit of light down in there. And they are all acceptable compromises. And that's, that's what this kind of photography is all about. Every time you try to squeeze out a bit more magnification, you're making the lighting worse. Every time uh, every time you do something to make the lighting a little bit better, you lose magnification. Or you get the light and you get the magnification perfect, but you've closed down your wide angle background to the size of the specimen, in which case you should have just used a macro lens. When you set up your shot, if the most exciting part of your image is the background, and sometimes it will be, move your specimen out of the way, position it on the, the side, leave room for the background to shine. If the background's fairly mundane, but your specimen is a rare spider or something, put it in the middle and let the, the background augment the photograph without overtaking it. Be conscious of, of what needs the most attention and then compose accordingly. While we still have a few minutes of light, let's go down to the bay and walk around a little bit, see if we can come up with any interesting compositions or ideas for a shot. Don't forget to take your thing. I brought you down to one of my favorite spots in the area that I live in for this kind of photography, but also for plenty of other kinds. But let me show you around this little park. It's a tiny park, but it has so many features that make for fantastic wide angle macro. Let's have a look.
so beautiful out here tonight, I simply do not have it in me to go back to the studio. So I'm gonna say goodbye from here. I hope you found this information uh, helpful. This kind of photography is quite challenging and you're gonna get a lot fewer hits than you get misses, especially at first. The good news is it's well worth it. It is well worth the effort. It's well worth the disappointing shots. Uh, I don't do it nearly often enough, but uh, yeah, I've got a lovely place to do it. I hope you do as well. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, subscribing and liking and all the things that you do. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you again in a few days with something uh, different, <laughs> as always. Thank you.